Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to um, our design session that I am hoping will become a staple of our um, ecosystem in terms of Web3 education. Um, and we are going to um, run it, as you've seen a little bit from the description. Um, we're going to do two awesome presentations to begin with. And then we're going to um, have an office hours. Now, what and the way we want to run that is essentially any questions you have, if you're halfway through building your project and you want a little bit of uh, feedback on what you have so far, um, we can potentially look at doing like little mini audits and so on and, and giving you the feedback that you that you um, hopefully um, need to to continue building uh, the awesome applications that you're um, working on. And so we're going to start off with Sasha, who's going to um, chat zero to hero. Um, and we're going to do a little bit of a uh, an engagement uh, or practical exercise in terms of personas. Then we're going to have Johnny from you talk a little bit about identity obviously a key piece uh, in in building decentralized applications and then um, we'll have um, Sasha and Johnny and Amy and uh, Julian basically co uh, collaborate on that office hours and hopefully give you guys some very very important feedback um, we're gonna kick off with Sasha um, shall we give it another like two minutes I don't know because I see loads of people are coming coming in. So um, yeah, we're going to do two minutes. And also in the practical session, when um, Sasha will will ask you some questions, what we'll do is you're able to unmute yourselves, but for it to all flow nicely and for us all to have good audio throughout, I'd ask you to mute yourself as soon as you're done uh, contributing or asking your questions so that we don't have any background noise and so on. Um, and I think we have, oh no, um, Heather, I think Diego, when we kicked him out, he can't log back in because the, it thinks he's a troll. <laughs> we had somebody join a little bit earlier when we were going through logistics. So, okay, great. Um, <laughs> just so we don't, you know, keep design for people it would be terrible shame. Um, and we're also going to record the session so that um, for anybody who um, wants to reference it later and so on, we're going to share it hopefully on, on Discord or upload it onto um, YouTube as well. So we have it for, for reference um, for future sessions. Um, what might be good, I think, is if you guys... Um, no, let's just go in, in order. Um, we'll just go with Sasha, start with Sasha, and then we'll... We'll carry on from there. Does that work? Perfect. So I'll start the cool. screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Take it away. So you're all guys seeing this, right? From zero to hero, how to tailor your product for you for your your users, right? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Cool. So. Today's talk will be a course about personas designed to take you through some persona creation process fundamentals. Uh, after this course, you will have a better understanding of your users' needs and how might you build useful and satisfying products. It will change the way you look at things and uh, with some exercise, it may change your perspective uh, on the way you should kickstart a product. So the talk will not guarantee you to be a UX designer, but it's addressing anyone who builds software products as a part of their work. So what are personas? Um, a persona is a user archetype you can use to help guide decisions about product features, navigation, interaction, and even visual design. This is a quote and a definition given by Alan Cooper, popularly known as the father of Visual Basic, who has built a, this uh, UX design tool. Uh, the first persona in the history of UX design appeared in 1983. She was called Cassie, and she was a traffic manager for an advertising agency. During Cooper's long walks, uh, he would fictionally talk to Cassie to find if what he was designing was still matching her needs. So what is a user persona? 
A persona is a fictional character which, like in a movie, has a goal set, a purpose which she tries to achieve. It's a fictional yet realistic description of a typical or target user of uh, your product. A UX tool which helps you, uh, you designers, learn more about um, your users. So what are not personas? User groups are not the same as creating the persona, statistics and impersonal user metrics, which are difficult to keep in mind, those are not personas. Marketing segments masqueraded as personas, not at all. It's not a list of tasks or duties. So persona creation process, let's go a bit through this. Um, ideally, the persona creation process should be a part of the research phase for a product or feature, before the actual design process starts. So field studies, surveys, longitudinal studies, interviews, and any other qualitative methods of user research should be conducted first to define characteristics of typical users. Once user research uh, has been completed, personas and scenarios can uh, then be derived from data. So let's go a bit through the persona creation process. And, and, think of it when finding similarities merge them together uh, it's best done as a team not because it is bit difficult but because it will uh, garner more support for the use of personas from team members able to contribute to the process so it will not be like magic i'm the ux designer i go in a dark room and then i come up with this and look i created this masterpiece you put it uh, uh, pin it up like a pin up uh, work of art. So this is how you should uh, engage your team. Uh, eliminate any characteristics uh, groups that appear less important to the business. And once distinct roles emerge, add details to make uh, the character more realistic, believable, and memorable. Keep your persona set small. Have a minimum number of personas required. Um, to illustrate key goals and behavior patterns. There's no magic number, but if you're designing a consumer product and you have a dozen personas, then you may be making distinctions that aren't very important. Uh, okay, so for example, uh, if you're creating an electronic family calendar, your persona set might include a career mom, a stay-at-home mom, a career dad, and a teenager. Um, if the career mom has the same needs as the career dad and also does all the family management as the stay-at-home mom does, you may be able to eliminate both the dad and the stay-at-home mom. So uh, let's go through a persona creation cheat sheet. Uh, it's, it's a checklist so we can um, build a persona. So, uh, so common pieces of information to include in uh, a persona should be name, age, gender, and the photo. But these aren't uh, real demographics and they aren't important for this. It's just only to give more realness for the fictional character. Uh, a tagline. Um, this, uh, this means describing what they do in real life. And you should avoid getting too witty as, do, as doing so uh may paint your persona so i know it's fun and stuff but it's not really useful to get with you here um experience level in the area of your product or service context for how they would interact with your product through choice or required by job how often would they use it do they typically use a desktop computer to access it or the phone or other device uh also map uh, her goals and concerns when they perform relevant tasks, speed, accuracy, thoroughness, or any other needs they, that may factor into their usage. And some quotes to sum up uh, the persona's attitude. Add life to the personas, but remember they are a design tool first. So uh, sometimes it's easy to focus too much on a persona's biography, personal details can be the fun part, but if there are too many of them, they just get in the way. And to avoid this problem, focus first on the workflow, on behavior patterns, on goals, environment, on attitudes of the personas without adding any personality. 
uh, common mistakes <laughs> that are making the persona die in their infancy, unfortunately, are some of these. Personas were created, but nobody used them. This situation often occurs when people don't know how they can effectively use personas to impact their projects. Not everybody knows why this tool is useful. Uh, so it is up to us designers to educate and uh, educate our stakeholders, our developers, our team. So we should illustrate the effectiveness of uh, this tool. Uh, skeptical leadership. We already know our users. Of course, everybody knows their users and stakeholders know a lot about their customers, but um, personas can be a very good tool to define a clear picture of specific types of users and having a specific user representation saves us from designing for ourselves and debating long hours on what the user wants without real facts. Personas are created without involving the team in the process. And uh, I was talking about uh, previously that you should actually involve your team. Involving your team in the process or cre uh, of creating user personas doesn't mean that you will work shoulder to shoulder every step along the way. You can invite them to the research process, send recaps or activities undertaken in the persona creative process. This will help uh, your team empathize and understand the personas aren't just artwork from the UX team. We already have a DAP developer persona. Why can't we just recycle it? And this is a very fatal mistake because uh, organizations with more than one product often want to use the same personas over and over. So unfortunately, this doesn't work because effective personas must, must be context specific. They should be focused on the behaviors and goals related to the product specific of a domain. So, uh, let's uh, create a persona together. And now I will ask you to unmute yourselves um, because I will use Miro and I have put together a little um, persona mapping and I would love you to help me create this fictional persona. So because we, we cannot do interviews beforehand, but we are all hackathon participants and we know what what this is about uh, we are going to make a persona for a hackathon participant and the brief is like this uh, virtual hackathon organizers want to step up their game so they need to find out more about their users goals pains and games and we will start um, with the persona just uh, putting an age, putting a name, putting a gender, uh, creating a tagline. So I would really love you to um, start and help me now, okay? What do we want to do? Just literally throw information at you? Yeah, exactly. Starting so with we, age? Yeah, we will start with age. What, what do you think a, a hackathon persona could have be like around, I don't know, 24, 27, 30? Let's throw an age here. Everybody, you can unmute yourselves and, and inform this map. Doesn't matter who. I guess we could uh, be the millennial generation. Perfect. Then 30 it is. <laughs> yeah. So let's give it a name. Uh, let's say um, Jeff. We have Jeff, he's a participant, he's 30, he's a male. Let's bring Jeff's picture, don't worry, this is not a real person. It's generated by an AI. So Jeff is completely anonymous and stays safe. Um, let's, let's give Jeff um, some, um, some tagline. I don't know, let's say, um, I love participating at hackathons. 
And this, this you, here you could help me because you know what's your motivation or things like that. So I would love you to help me here. Let's give Jeff a tagline. Okay, because they are challenging. Uh, okay, so we'll um, continue with Jeff's personality. Anyone want to help me here? Jeff loves dogs. Okay, Jeff loves dogs. Start there. Okay. Loves dogs. Um, he has a bubbly personality. Uh, and let's say Jeff is a um, catalyst in his group. So he's sort of a, let's say, early adopter. Okay, let's go ahead and build uh, Jeff's interest. He likes attending Eat Globe hackathons. Perfect. Um, let's say he wants to uh, find a VC, maybe, for his uh, uh, product. Could we say that? Or maybe he wants to find a team. What do you think? I think this should, also, this should be more like goals. Um, Interest, solidity. <laughs> um, is Jeff interested in any specific industries or use cases? Is he focused on supply chain stuff or is it a money finance guy or yeah. is it a it, DAO we, person? Or? We, should, we, should, uh, we should add this here. Like, uh, maybe he's interested in DeFi. Okay, uh, what else could Jeff be interested in? Does establishing credibility, like if having his idea be established credible in the community count? Um, yeah, but uh, this might be a goal for Jeff. Because uh, I think this is why he would go to the hackathon, right? to establish himself in the community. Am I right? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, perfect. So let's put this here. Establish himself in the... Uh, perfect. Oh, let's, let's uh, leave the interest now because we have, I think we have uh, enough, but Let's cast our minds back a bit because we are talking about uh, virtual hackathons. So mm, let's say um, he has these goals. Um, we could add another goal, but maybe in pains we can say, Jeff misses a uh, human connection and he feels like um, he can sell his product easier uh, from person to person communication than virtual communication. Might that be a good pain, a good pain point? Okay. <laughs> what 
Okay. What other pains could uh, Jeff have towards the fact that uh, he is now attending virtual hackathons and not um, in person hackathons? Yeah, time zones. That's a good point. Yeah, good point. Access to mentorship or access resources. That's a goal or a pain? Access to mentorship. I mean, I was going to say pain. But. Okay, perfect. We'll put it there then. He cannot access uh, mentorship, so this is why he's participating to, to hackathons. So somehow uh, accessing mentorship is his end goal, even though uh, it's starting from a pain point. But we will keep it here because we can turn it afterwards in an opportunity. Um, okay, any, any other pains that come into your mind? Well, maybe since Jeff is, uh, you know, he has a bubbly personality and he seems to be like a, an extrovert of sorts that these remote hackathons don't really give him that same level of, you know, the, the networking and uh, um, the serendipitous kind of mm -hmm. moments, all of that. And I guess there's also, you know, just fundamentally less chance that he'll meet dogs as well, since that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So let's make a skill set for Jeff. Um, so um, he's a very good communicator. Uh, let's give him another skill. Um, he's keeping it, is himself, um, keeping himself up to date with, um, new Ethereum frameworks, let's say. Mike, does this sound good? Yeah, I was going to ask how, um, how, ex I know that we wrote that, you know, Jeff, loves participating in the hackathons, but is this his first or his 10th Ethereum hackathon? How new to this Ethereum space is? Jeff? Well, we should, we should uh, think of this and put it in uh, his context. So maybe we, we can say here, maybe Jeff is uh, uh, an OG in hackathons, or maybe Jeff has discovered these hackathons now, so he might have different uh, goals. But apparently, since uh, he wants to establish himself in the community and uh, wants to find um, a VC, he might be new, right? So we could say it's his first time. Okay, so I'm, I'm, are you guys writing in uh, the chat? Because I can't really see it. Not too much. There were a few comments. But. Okay. Um, so maybe, maybe because you are um, participating to hackathons, you could um, think a bit of yourself. This is what we would we wouldn't do this usually because we are not our users, but right now we, all of us uh, might have a ton of insights. So uh, you could help me with some other insights that you might have and we could build uh, Jeff better. Um, what about his tech savviness?
they've done some, Jeff has done some initial Solidity tutorials, but they're not, um, let's say they're just beginning to learn. Okay, perfect. So could it be uh, in Jeff's goal also to uh, find more skilled uh, devs and learn a bit more, step up his game in solidity, maybe? Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Has Jeff ever deployed a smart contract? Let's think. Um, let, let's let's uh, brainstorm a brainstorm a bit here. How many um, DAP developers or smart contract developers would start uh, doing a smart contract on the spot for a hackathon? <laughs> so. Probably we should, I don't know. He may have written a smart contract at least one to see how it works before uh, joining a hackathon, no? Yeah, Maybe. that makes sense. Yeah, I was gonna say, let's say Jeff has, he's played around with some smart contracts in like Remix or something like that. Perfect. Okay, so somehow we, we've we've uh, developed a bit uh, Jeff, and we know some things about him. Usually, this should have been um, data driven, so uh, it would have been after doing some affinity mapping, going through the data we got from interviews, and bucketing characteristics together uh, for this. Right now, it's just like uh, this is usually called uh, a proto persona. This is only based on our assumptions, but we should actually afterwards try to uh, really challenge our assumptions and do little interviews, maybe guerrilla testing, maybe uh, guerrilla interviews. But anyway, we shouldn't stay with this type of proto persona because it's very biased from the start. But uh, on the other hand, in a hackathon, this would really help us to know who are we writing, who are we building uh, the products that we are doing. So this, this could be a good tool when you're starting a, a project for a hackathon. Maybe it's an idea, you're brainstorming with the team. This would help you a lot, but uh, never forget you really have to go through uh, user research and user interviews afterwards. Um, so let's let's go back to um, here. So this is how uh, usually uh, a, a persona should uh, look like afterwards. Uh, this was made, uh, this is a DAP developer persona uh, made for a monitoring product. And um, here he has some goals, he wants to be more productive, wants to have everything under the same software, a strong need to order and bucketing in a workflow. Um, his frustrations, which are equally equal to pains. He has too much manual work, writing their own tests. Uh, it is very hard to extract the output of the software into something more usable. The possibility of an attack to be hacked is big and that is a big responsibility on the shoulders that and having these uh, frustrations, if you can spot these type of patterns, then you have uh, you you can transform them into opportunities for your product. And this means that if if there is a need on the market, you will come with something that will um, help people. And because of this, they will um, they may uh, adopt better uh, your product because they feel like you are actually doing something for them. Um, 
Okay, and uh, I recommend you this book. It's called UX Fundamentals uh, for Non-UX Professionals. It's a great book. You can find it on Amazon. And this is me. Uh, thank you for participating. I hope you liked it. And uh, I will stop my screen share now. Do we have any questions about personas? Um, yes, that was awesome, Sasha. Thank you. And dare I say, one of the most engaging things we have achieved in a virtual setting so far with all of the events going virtual. So that was awesome. Um, yeah, any questions on personas from the teams um, or from anybody? Really? Um, if not, we can... I do have one question. Oh. Um, I'm just curious, at what point in the design process is it typically used, like when you've, way before you've even thought of um, exactly how the product's going to be framed, or is it sort of an iterative, you keep developing this uh, person as you kind of include more features? Uh, so so uh, you shouldn't develop the person uh, while you include more features. Actually, you should um, somehow try to do the features matching this persona. So um, you should start doing uh, the persona before you're actually developing the product. And every time you work on a user journey or, or for a workflow or, flow or anything like that for your product, you should somehow try to step in your persona's shoes and think, would, would Jeff really go to a virtual hackathon again if he didn't um, feel like he can get his goals? N no, yes. And then you, you, you're, you keep on uh, developing and iterating your product and try to respond to, to his needs or her needs. Um, but it's very important to have actual data from real users and not uh, fictional even though the persona is not a fictional person, uh, it has a real trait. Yeah, we so I have a question, this is Vanna. So for our product, we would have multiple personas and they would be various age groups. So how do you deal with that? Well, um, it's, I mean, sometimes you don't, uh, age groups, might only be um, just to make it more real. Sometimes age groups might uh, actually um, affect the way a persona has uh, its goals and needs. So if you're developing, I don't know, um, a, a, a scooter um, app, or let's think of something that is uh, only for for elder people, you might have it affected. So I think you you should have a core persona and try not to um, uh, try try to um, make the product for a core persona because if you try to uh, make it good for all of them, you might uh, end up with a patchwork, toyuboyu type of uh, product. So you should definitely uh, choose it very well and understand who really is your core user and who do you really want to address. It, at the moment, I don't really know more, much more about your product except of the fact that you try to um, market it or de develop it for a really big um, age range but i don't know more so i might so give... if, if it's more like a decentralized amazon okay so um what what are you actually asking me if that is a problem if you have uh, more uh, uh more type of uh, m many many age groups maybe you could think of uh, accessibility if you have uh, Elder people, they might not uh, see very well, and uh, they might be um, having uh, technology angst because they don't uh, 
do things. I don't know. They they don't have all of this knowledge. So you do have to think of them, which are their goals, which are their things, and try to shape it um, to make room for them too. But think of it. Uh, what what's the percent of the elderly and what's the percent of the youngsters? If it's 80% youngsters and 20% elderly, I think you should concentrate on the youngsters. So you, sometimes you need to, um, you, you have to win some and lose some. You, you cannot uh, make everybody happy. So you have to make this decision and go by it. I would, say, I would say, uh, sorry to intervene like that, and I don't know how much uh, you want this session to be interactive with everyone else, but uh, I would say in your case, Vienna, uh, the age is not the issue. Um, your persona should be focused on why are people going to an Amazon, decentralized Amazon, right? What is the problem they're trying to solve, right? Are they looking to avoid uh, the classic or the traditional Amazon platform, why are they there? And then think of the age and issues associated with age and goals associated with age. Yeah, to build on what Bogdan was saying, I think one of the things that I do as well, uh, you know, in addition to the personas that I put together is um, there's something called the jobs to be done framework that some of you might have heard of. And I think that this is another Thing you can add to your personas that um, can kind of tie disparate groups together and figure out how they relate. So it, it in some in a lot of cases, uh, it doesn't matter so much what their age is as long as they have the same job that they're trying to get done. So um, that job might break down along you know age lines, right? So you know, 16-year-old kids in America have a job to be done where they need to get a driver's license, and that's like a very age-related thing. Um, and in some cases, age doesn't matter as much. But I think, yeah, as Bogdan was saying, one thing to think about is what job is is are, are the people trying to get done, and does that relate to age? That's that's an excellent. Uh approach on it right there <laughs> and here's the book if you want to <laughs> follow the the script um and i think any, somebody else asked when when is the right time to to build a persona uh, the persona gets developed over time you start with the problem are you are you trying to solve a problem and you go after that problem by talking to people getting involved in their life uh doing all this exploratory research uh, or what we call discovery and product development and that's how you build persona over time. And that adds to the, to the details of jobs to be done, goals, pain points, and all that. Well, cool. and Heather has linked the um, framework in the chat. So that's super helpful. And does that also answer your question, HK? ish <laughs> i don't know if you want to if anybody wants to take a, a stab at this one how do you decide between two contrasting personas if you don't have any data yet so like hardcore devs versus super noobs just talk to someone i mean i think like pick one start what with start with one person right and that that person will tell you if you're on the right track or not. And then you go to the second one that's hopefully on track. And, uh, you know, over time you end up talking to a lot of people and then you develop the persona and the dimensions of the persona get more granular. And I think that's important to understand that you, you react to that persona when your product goes out, you build your product and then you have people react to it. You add more quantitative data, more qualitative data through usability research interviews, all that. And then you, you change your goals. You, you might adapt your product. You might pivot your company through those conversations. So it's not a static thing. It's not a thing that you do in, you know, June 2018 and you stay with it until, you know, July 2025. 
all, all personas evolve and they should evolve. If your persona is not evolving, then you're not doing anything. <laughs> you're not learning anything more. Which is a big mistake because it might mean that you have stopped iterating and you think your product is done and it's never finished. So yeah. That's right. Well, then says it very well you should uh, evolve the product but also think that you're not staying the same from one year to another so how could the persona stay the same so you have constantly have to talk to your users and update everything Okay, and we have, how do you validate an idea if people aren't familiar with it? Who's people? Kate, do you want to? Hi. Um, yeah. Um, yes, so my whole thing is that I want to make Ethereum and using cryptocurrency more accessible to people who aren't using it at the moment. They are not interested in it. It is too confusing for them. How do you actually validate the idea if there is the bridge is so big between the non-users and the users. I don't think you can force validation there. And that's a huge problem for, for the Ethereum space and for crypto space in general. There, there's nothing to validate there. The, the only validation you get is, do they understand it or not? Do they like it or not? Uh, validation doesn't mean convincing the user to, to adopt something. Um, it only fits when it fits into their mental model. And so I think that's my, another important detail to understand. Go ahead. My hypothesis is that if it is easy enough for me to make decisions and to use it, then more people will use it. So that's what I, I want to validate. But what, what is the main I decision? What, what is the main decision to validate? But first, what I've boiled it down to is that um, basically, how can you grow your money? Because that's all people use crypto for what it seems is to grow assets. That's a great, so that's a great hypothesis. Formulating that hypothesis, I want to grow my money, right? So you go talk to people and you ask them, how do you grow your money? Do you want to grow your money? And the answer is hopefully yes. Okay. How do you grow your money? And then you go, okay, I go to a traditional broker. I go to... Um, I trade by myself, whatever instrument I use, financial instrument to grow my money, right? And then you ask, okay, have you ever considered Ethereum? Have you ever considered crypto space? No. Okay, why? And now you, now you are getting closer to the problem. Why are you not considering? Lack of knowledge, uh, technical background, whatever it is, right? But then it gets to the proof because someone will tell you, well, I'm actually... I've been there um, and I'm not considering Ethereum or any other, other crypto space because it's not growing my money at the rate I'm currently growing, right? So that's a barrier you need to, to pass and you, you need to show evidence, right? Well, I can guarantee you 20% instead of 8% or 10% 10, 10 you get with your broker. But then so, you have to provide evidence because then it's in the context of, but I see a lot of volatility. When, when is that person entering crypto space, right? How long have they been there? What's their past experience? Because then you see personas along the way, people that started five years ago and they're happy. People that started two years ago and they're done. Why? Because I started with Bitcoin. I thought it's going to go to 100,000. I bought it 10,000, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's down. So you are not solving that, that person's problem. The pain point is still there. I'm not growing my money. What you're saying is against the evidence I have. So again, it's validating. You can only validate as far as you, as you match the same mental model. If you don't match that, then you have to convince. And that's a different kind of tool, marketing, blah, blah, blah. So it's actually taking smaller steps. Oh, for sure. Don't jump to, uh, you know, five years from now, we're going to do this. Uh, those roadmaps of five years from now are, are just a, a joke. Look at healthcare, right? If you ever worked in healthcare with any healthcare co company, five years ago, they all had that thing on the wall. 
the future of healthcare. 2020 is gonna be the future of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And look where we're now, right? Hypothesis destroyed, right? So, the, you know, small steps, incremental development, not five-year visions. Yeah, so, so it's more like a GPS trying to autocorrect towards a vision, but the vision keeps changing like the rainbow at the end of the, or the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Thank you. That makes so much sense. Um, one thing I was going to add that uh, I do sometimes is like in, in this case that um, if growing the money is, is kind of the job to be done in this case. Um, I don't know. There's also another book that I've been rereading lately called The Innovator's Dilemma, which um, was kind of came out in the mid nineties and was kind of on the front edge. Maybe I guess you might say before like modern product design and UX was kind of uh, developed and used. Um, and this was like pre the internet, but um, in it, he kind of lays out uh, jobs to be done before it's called jobs to be done. And um, he talks a lot about Clayton Christensen is the author. He talks a lot about the value of watching people use products rather than asking them about them. And that when you're working with disruptive technologies that people have a hard time, and this is what Ethereum runs into in a lot of cases, they have a hard time imagining how they might use something. And so you really have to observe them using either Ethereum or things like it, right? So they're not already a user of Ethereum, so it's hard to get them to observe them doing it. But the thing I think about is testing comparable products that are already in market that aren't your product to try and get insight. So like something I would do is talk to Robinhood users or something like that, right? Where they have crypto present and find out how many Robinhood users are, are buying ETH in addition to the other things that they're buying in that app, right? They, you can buy traditional stocks and ETFs and everything in Robinhood, but you can also buy Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it'd be interesting to know from a Robinhood, you know, you know, 10 or 15 Robinhood users, have they ever clicked on those Ethereum and Bitcoin buttons in that app? Like, why haven't they, right? Like, and you can pick up from another product team's, um, you know, product as, as, as a jumping off point for prototyping and gathering insights about what you want to do, right? So you don't retrace some of their failures and stuff like that. So that's another way to kind of uh, jumpstart the process, I think. Another great that point. Is this is all about context. Contextual inquiry is a, is a method of getting there. But again, you have to be close to the users. You have to spend time with them as much as you can uh, and, and be there with them, experience the problem, seeing the problem firsthand and seeing the context of how they're trying to solve it for. That, that's my approach and now I'm in lockdown, so what now? There, there are a lot of remote tools if you can recruit uh, people um, yeah, through whatever channel. Uh, there are tons of remote tools where you can observe and discuss and. Um, and they have the time. Hopefully some of your users have the time to chat. So, um, you know, use the opportunity to, to talk more and discover more actually. But it Which will tool help would you recommend? make a screener, uh, first of all, and try a bit to think which might be the user you are targeting and then try to find them out. Because there are a ton of site, websites with people who are uh, willing to respond and work remotely. So it's not, not a problem. You can interview them via Zoom and you can screen them and uh, recruit them. But it's very important not to talk to, I don't know, people who wouldn't be actually giving you any uh, good information uh, concerning your product. And also you are saying something that you want to do, uh, you want to help people, um, but people don't really ask for help. So maybe we should take a step back and think maybe if it's not needed yet, maybe I shouldn't do it. I mean, when you're starting something, you should actually make it not because you fall in love with your idea or it sounds really, really cool because there's, I mean, it happens to everyone, but 
you have to validate it, but not validate as in, I like this, <laughs> let's validate this. How might I shove my idea up my user's throat? So you don't have to do that. Just, I don't know. And think which are, which are the pains and fears they are facing. Maybe this could uh, paint you a picture. Yep. That yeah, and I, I, I wanted to clarify that, um, though I said, I mean, I think ideally the best case is quote unquote to watch the user use the product. I think it is also perfectly fine to talk, still interview users who have used a product. I think just the distinction that um, at least Clayton Christensen draws in his book um, is that you want to not ask people about, I mean, you, you, I, I still believe it is valuable to do generative research, like pre product building. Um, but you, the real insights typically come once something has been in their hands and you are, uh, they're, they're responding to it. And over time sitting with it, they figure out how it fits into their life. And I, so that doesn't actually mean necessarily watching them like in a, like in a, physical setting, watching them use the product, although that is also really good if you can do that. I, but um, simply talking to people who have spent time with a product or in a context and talking to them about their experience. So they're not, they're not speculating on what they might do anymore, right? And I think that that's the, the important part because people end up speculating on how they might use something. And then I think all of us typically, once it's in your hands and you're using it day to day, uh, it turns out your own speculations about how you would behave are wrong. Um, and so I think that's the important part. I think, I think both, you know, Sasha and Johnny are right. Um, on Sasha's side, you, you want to target your research. If you have a project that you want to get done, target your users, target your research. At the same time, talking to uh, people that are not necessarily a, a perfect overlap with your uh, product or solution or, idea um, are a good uh, source for generating new ideas, right? So you start with ideas, start with a problem, and then you realize, well, actually people don't experience the problem I'm posing. They're experiencing a different problem and that's worth solving for, right? So, so you pivot from there and that's still beneficial. It's actually highly valuable. Think of all the companies that started with an idea, pivoted and, and became successful. Twitter included or whatever. I think there are hundreds of cases. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, do we want to move to Johnny and chat about identity? I had one more, one yes. small question, possibly. Go. Um, how often, just like as a general rule do you revisit uh these kind of things as far as i like guess it's, it's good to keep them up to date but you can't keep them up all the time can't revisit them all the time is there like a cadence you recommend for evaluating your personas it it really depends on your development cadence right uh what methodology you use uh what flavor of agile scrum kanban whatever and how those uh tracks of development discovery design are layered and so if you, if you test prototypes every two weeks, um, then you might find out that talking to people every two weeks gets you in a different place. And that's when you update. After three, four, five months of conversations, uh, and not just conversation, let me make this clear. Uh, interviews are not the only uh, <laughs> UX research tool out there, and there are hundreds of them. But by doing that on, on constant basis, um, you learn more. So a rule of thumb, update your persona when you learn something new. But, but keep a cadence, keep a, a, a flow of research. Um, don't give up on it. And um, yeah, basically stay close to your users through whatever means you can, as long as you can. Awesome, thank you. Hi everyone, I have a last question. Sorry for that. Um, I would like to know if, if you feed your personas with quantitative data, if the product exists already. 
Oh, for sure. And you should, right? And so it depends on how you collect that data, how good it is, right? So collecting data alone is not gonna give you a lot of answers. You, you still have to process, analyze that data, clean it up uh, and match it with real behaviors that you see in the real world, right? So looking at uh, quantitative data in isolation, it, it can be very misleading uh, because the data is not gonna tell you why, right? You can look at a lot of numbers, a lot of Excel files, and they will tell you what people do, but they're not gonna tell you why they do it. So understanding that through qualitative research is as important, if not more. So, but yeah, combine them both. So quantitative is just like red flagging the issues, and then you uh, deep dive with uh, qualitative research. I think this is what uh, Bogdan was saying also. Does that make sense, Diego? Yeah, sure, Does sure. That answer sure. Your totally agree. Thanks, Alan. Do we want to uh, move on to Johnny and he can chat identity um, and then have a Q&A round for him and then we can move into um, any specific um, Q&A or mini audits and so on. Cool, Johnny. Yeah, so I actually stage, was going to- AKA the screen. Yeah, so I was gonna actually propose a bit of a pivot. We don't have to, but um, a, I have, uh, I, I realized I had a presentation sitting here that I'd given at Build ETH about a year ago about um, the UX UI fundamentals of Web3, which might be more relevant to this being a design thing, or I, we can still talk about identity, but which is less design focused, but, um, what do you think? Does anybody care or is anybody think um, one would be better than the other? Because we can, I can talk about identity all day and we can talk about identity after, but also UX, UI, since this is a design thing and you're all are currently building stuff could be, I just worry that maybe not everybody needs to know the identity stuff since some of it might not have, you know, be relating to it, but um, I just want to throw that out there in case me. Uh, this is uh, John here with Anna. Um, they both sound interesting. I was curious about the identity piece though, because we'll have um, uh, you know, users that we want to have persistent reputations and have them hmm. somehow carry that identity across different places. Like if it's a seller, they might be selling on Facebook, Craigslist, Shopify, and their own hmm. website. Um, and like our you know global marketplace, so we're not really sure how to handle that piece yet. So I don't know if the identity can touch on that. All right. Well then, um, okay. Yeah. Let's stick to the plan. Um, I'll I'll run through some identity stuff first, and if we I know that this is a pretty long session, so we can always touch on some of the, or I can just even give y'all the deck a link to the deck, and you can go through it on your own time around the UX UI stuff of of Web three. Um, okay. Cool, let me pull up my identity presentation. Um, let's see. Grab it here. I hadn't I, I thought I thought we were gonna end up pivoting, so I didn't have it open. So let me give me a second to find the identity presentation here. Yeah, we can make sure that um, we send them to to everybody who signed up. I think that would be useful. The decks, I mean. Cool. So it's loading. No worries. Oops, okay, hold on. That was the wrong one. That one accidentally has about a thousand blank slides in it somehow. Um,
friendly. The suspense is killing us. Sorry, I got it now. Great. So let me share. I'm going to turn my camera off just for this so I don't get any lagging or whatever. Um, okay, great. So everybody see my screen? Good? Okay. Um, yes. So yeah, uh, I work at um, Uport, um, which is a part of Consensus. So I've been working at the intersection of identity and blockchain and stuff like that for about five years and working on identity, decentralized self-sovereign identity stuff for about three years. Um, and I'm a product designer, uh, UX, UI, kind of also design strategy stuff. So um, kind of a generalist in that sense. Um, and so for this, uh, this the way I started this off, um, the last time I gave this is I want you to imagine um, this is a new a new product in development called uh, DeFi Credit, um, and so uh, here we have uh, what it, what it would be a, a login screen for something called DeFi Credit. So you're seconds away from getting the best decentralized lending rates. So one of the big problems we know in DeFi, or, or big use cases potentially, or opportunity areas you might say, is the ability to offer you know under collateralized loans and peer to peer loans um uh like the traditional you know in the you know this is the type of loan we typically think in in the traditional world and we haven't been able to bring this to defi yet um so what you can do here you connect your metabask defi credit would like to connect to your account um and so you click connect then you're gonna get a continue with Facebook button. Then you're gonna continue, you know, it's gonna ask you to do the login. I'm gonna continue as Johnny. You're gonna get a socially derived credit score here, 656, and you're gonna have this asset access to loan. So, however, okay, so this is fake. This isn't a thing that we should actually do. And I just use this to uh, highlight the problem. So, this is something that is uh, was a mock little experience that I put together because I had seen this idea at a hackathon um, in the past, which was to use social media stuff as a um, as a as a vehicle for creating some sort of credit score of some sort that we could use in the DeFi space. But this is a bad idea, and we'll talk about that. So. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the reason that this is a bad idea is I'm sure y'all are all might be familiar with Cambridge Analytica. So for those not familiar with Cambridge Analytica, 2016, in the 2016 US elections, um, Cambridge Analytica was a, you know, a data and market research firm that worked with the Trump campaign, they worked with the Brexit campaign, um, and or the specifically the leave side of the Brexit campaign, and um, to to draw some insights that they could from publicly available data uh, for for marketing the campaigns, right? So, what would happen if this is what this screen said, right? There's a good chance that this will elect Donald Trump. What if that was the big red box? Um, when you when you when you're about to connect your Facebook, would this affect the user experience? Right. Um, my estimation is most likely yes. This would affect people clicking on that button, and this is where we get into ideas around consent and privacy um, that are going to be very important as we move into like a DeFi world. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, surveillance capitalism and identity. And these are the things we need to keep aware of when we build our, our DeFi systems here. So in the past, uh, the way identity kind of worked was you were given identities from servers, right? So you might have your Amazon identity and your Facebook identity. And these things were 
given to you. This is what happens when you sign up, right? In the traditional sense, um, you get to choose an email or whatnot. Um, so that feels like a choice, but really, as you know, many of us probably here already know, on the back end, um, they're giving you an identifier um, that they are going to associate a lot of data about you with. What we wanna do is we wanna invert this model. So there's this interesting, um, you know, we talk about decentralizing lots of systems and we talk about decentralizing identity, but another way to frame this is also to think about re-centralizing identity around the user rather than around the servers and the systems. So in this case, um, identity is, uh, you're, you are giving your identity to these different services. Um, and the, the flow of consent kind of, or, or the power structure here kind of inverts. Um, so there's this concept called responsabilization, which uh, this kind of alludes to. So responsabilization is just when a change in a system happens and the responsibilities that fell with one actor um, get shifted onto another actor. And so when you change systems, uh, this, can, this can happen. And this, if this happens without telling people and, and the people whose responsibilities are being moved around aren't aware because you know, about, you know, about that change, um, this can present a lot of problems. So um, when we are, you know, the thing that breaks on-chain stuff is putting personal data on-chain. So this is what is going to actually end up breaking blockchains if we're not careful. Um, there is, uh, this gets into, uh, I want to talk a little bit about this paradox of privacy. Um, so the easiest thing in a lot of the early days of Ethereum, um, the idea was to, you know, I think I talked to some of the, uh, what was the name of their project? I can't remember, maybe I shouldn't say, but um, in, the, in the early days of Ethereum, there was uh, a lot of people trying to do decentralized marketplaces, decentralized Airbnb, decentralized Craigslist. And one of the initial ideas for how to accomplish that was to simply make the listings as part of on-chain. You, know, on uh, you submit your listing to a smart contract and you get like an on-chain listing of like your house or your car or something like that. And, some, and then people can respond to that listing um, you know, via, via Web3. And this was a, turned out to be a non-viable uh, way to do this because of the personal identifying information that goes on-chain. Um, and in conversations with some of those teams around that, there was this idea that, um, you know, people actually don't care about privacy, right? If they cared about privacy, they wouldn't use Facebook. They wouldn't use a lot of the services that they use. But uh, this then kind of highlights something in behavioral economics called the risk perception gap, um, which is relevant to trying to solve this privacy paradox, as we call it, um, around identity. So the risk perception gap um, is, is this idea that uh, the way you kind of like frame um, risk is, a, is going to change the outcomes of, or is gonna change the way people behave um, in a given scenario, even though the risks are the same, right? So this is something Daniel Kahneman and uh, Amos Tversky, uh, they wrote about it in, I think it, what was it? Thinking Fast and Slow? Is that their book? I can't remember. Um, but one of their books, they won, they won a Nobel Prize for some of this research. But um, a lot of people, uh, they will, you know, if you frame something as a opportunity, um, you know, if you flip a coin, you can get $5. Or if you flip the coin, you have a you have the chance to lose five dollars. Um, however, you frame that, even though the odds and the outcomes will be the same, um, they will behave differently. They'll either take the bet or, or not take the bet. And I think that this is a little uh, small insight that we can use to start understanding how to get around this privacy paradox, especially as it relates to DApps and on-chain data and things like that.
So um, there's this thing that a lot of people say, you know, whenever I bring up privacy to many people in user interviews, I hear a lot that, you know, this, I've got nothing to hide. So why should I worry? Um, so we also have heard in, in those same interviews when people tell us that they've got nothing to hide, uh, me and my former design partner, we did a lot of research around this stuff. And hold on one second, I need to get this chat window out of here so I can see this whole slide. Okay, um, so we heard that if, you know, Facebook, they, they would tell us if Facebook has my data, you know, I'm okay with it. But if Facebook is selling it to someone else, I'm uncomfortable because I don't have control over it. And so this kind of led us down this path of, uh, you know, what people really care about is feeling in control and having some agency in these systems. And uh, they'll make different choices based on uh, whether or not they feel like they're going to have control or not not necessarily directly about the privacy and the specific information being disclosed. Um, in design, uh, in UX, there is a field of, well, a, a set of patterns, I guess, called dark patterns. And so dark patterns in UX are things that have kind of arisen in application design or service design that are uh, that are designed and done so for the benefit of the system or for somebody other than the user, right? Um, and one of the most prominent ones that, and especially the one that relates to what we're talking about now is something called privacy zuckering as based on, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. And this is what I was showing off in that initial set of slides around that mock D5 product, which was, um, that was privacy zuckering. So, if we, if I went all the way back, actually, I'll do that really quickly, just so this connects. So if I go all the way back here, um, what this is saying, right? DeFi credit, this little, this little piece of text here is actually what you're consenting to in this step. So DeFi credit will receive your name, profile information, friends list, friends profile information, page, or page likes, and email address. That little that one bit of information, friends profile information, was what uh, Cambridge Analytica exploited when they ran their uh, whole campaign. So what they did um, was they actually had a personality quiz that they put out and people on Facebook would sign up to take this personality quiz and they would answer questions about themselves and give it access to their profile information. But the way the Facebook API worked um, you actually could consent to giving that application all of the information that you had access to from your friends, right? So if they had made things public to you, you could then make it public to this app. And people were just uh, out of almost muscle memory, you know, hitting this continue as Johnny button and consenting and not realizing what they were consenting to. And this is the exploitation of this dark pattern that allowed, you know, um, so much more information to be gathered than anybody thought was happening. So this would be a violation of informed consent on the, on the part of Facebook and the app. Um, so let's jump back over to run through all these little animations. So yeah, that's, that's privacy zuckering. And it is, and it's these dark patterns that make design a moral act, right? So the fact that you can design things in such a way that is harmful or exploitative means that now when you design your applications, there is some moral component, right? The choices you make have uh, like a real effect and can cause harm, which um, they are not simply just uh, arbitrary, objective um, choices. And, you know, in, in the case where you might say, well, who's to say um, what's wrong and what's right here? It's ultimately the user who has to decide, right? But 
we know that the way you frame things and the the way you set things up in an interface can you know exploit people and this is this is why we are mad at you know services like facebook or amazon or google um a lot of times so what uh we also want to you know I, I would recommend us to think about is that privacy is actually a spectrum it is not you either there's no such thing as pure privacy there's no such thing as pure anonymity right even in ethereum we don't we, we you throw around the term anonymous a lot but really you know it's you're pseudo anonymous um and or pseudonymous i mean um and what we can do is start thinking about privacy as as this spectrum and moving along it um, and moving backwards and forwards along it in any given context so that's re we really want to give users control to move along this spectrum is is the ideal that we're, we're shooting for um this brings me to this idea of contextual integrity around identity um, and this is Helen Nissenbaum is the researcher who kind of talks about this and it's the idea that uh, textual, integ textual integrity is this idea that it is about information flows and what was agreed to um, as what is the purpose of the information, uh, how is it going to be used, under what context, for how long, and it's when one of those inputs or, or variables changes that you violate contextual integrity so it's less about um it's less about privacy being this like monolithic thing and more about the way information in a system is handled over time and what what is agreed to um, when you interact with that system so you have the data subject you have the sender of the data the recipient of the data the information type and the transmission principle that you need to think about. Uh, don't get too caught up in this. I can send more information out. Uh, she has a lot of research on this. Um, so moving forward, um, there's also some really interesting research around uh, framing. Again, this is this framing idea again, and it was done by um, a researcher, last name Aquisti, I forget, Alessandro, I think, um, Aquisti. And he was doing a lot of research around uh, how to get people to make different privacy decisions based on perception, um, even though the privacy risks and things like that would be the same. And this is kind of relates back to what we're talking about in personas. Um, when we were talking about asking people about how they might use a product versus uh, how they actually use it once they have it in their hands and why one is more valuable than the other. So a lot of times in privacy research, we, we ask people hypothetical questions. What would you do in this scenario? And hypothetically, they say that they would protect, you know, they, they, they value privacy. And then what they actually do is they, and that's what that is, represented by um, uh, this. So if you look at hypothetical, and then you look at down here in the bottom left corner, bottom left quadrant, objective. So we typically ask people, you know, if, if we can state the privacy trade-offs as objective, like this is objectively worse privacy or objectively better privacy, um, when we ask them hypothetically what they'll do, um, they say that they'll preserve, they'll take the privacy preserving option. But when they actually put in the situation, they don't. They take the convenient option because these things are typically at odds. And that, that, those bottom two quadrants are what we call the um, privacy paradox. But what Alexander Acquisti found, or Alessandro Acquisti found, was um, that when privacy, uh, when he did the privacy research and he framed things relatively, and so this means not telling people if this is a better or worse, uh, more or less privacy, but if this is more or less privacy compared to your past behavior relative to what privacy you have now, 
that actually in the actual systems when people interact with them that they actually preserve their privacy and so this was a little insight that i think a lot of people in this space that are working on ux around privacy are trying to figure out how to apply in mature going to market products how to frame uh, privacy trade-offs as relative to that specific user so that we get this up arrow in the in the actual column um, so that's that's the goal. Um, there's uh, I also want to talk about uh, so consent. So when we we've we're moving away from in the past, I guess what we had was implied consent, right? So this is what happens when you sign some uh, you know terms of service or privacy policy, or it's you know in in an app you're doing a login flow or a sign up flow, and it says by continuing you agree to our privacy policy and our terms of service right that is implied consent you're implying that you can consent to it without actually uh, making explicit consent we have since tried to move to informed consent um this is you know still in progress i don't think we've done a great job of this but it's at least kind of what you know, when we read the New York Times articles and a lot of that um, around all of the privacy problems on the internet today, they're typically adv advocating for informed consent. Um, but I think what the, the real way to solve this at the UX level is going to be through what I'm calling progressive consent. Um, so this was originally presented at DevCon, um, this, this presentation. And this is kind of some stuff we are working on at Uport. It's not no longer actually specifically relevant uh, to our product anymore, but at the time, these were prototypes we were working with. Um, and the idea here was that Uport had this, uh, we had this idea of, of selective disclosure, where you, every time you interact with a new DAP, you can disclose data for that interaction. And here we were going to allow you, let's say this was some you know, decentralized ticketing app that DEF CON was going to use or something like that. You would be able to uh, consent to each piece of data, right? That you were sharing with uh, the DEF CON app. Um, so you could you know, click on these things, you could share your data, then we wanted to allow users to update their preferences. Um, so this was the, the, there's this trade-off here around progressive consent where you it's a burden, really. A, a lot of times people don't take advantage of the privacy options in applications because it's a burden, it's overhead, on, and it's, it's a cognitive load, as we call it. Um, and people really want the convenience. They're trying to get their job done, right? And their job typically isn't I want to preserve my privacy. Their job in this situation is I need to get into Dev DevCon. I need to share my ticket um, to the organizer so I can get in. Um, so we want to build. We wanted to build a system that allowed you to progressively build up um, consent, kind of a consent system of preferences. So we were going to after you share. You know, every time the first time you share a piece of information, you're talking about uh, your your able to select things that you would like to share, you know, mark as shareable in the future and things that uh, you wouldn't, you want to be asked every time, right? To streamline some of these selective disclosure processes over time. Um, these are just some more screens I'll run through. Let me see what's happening in the, um, so then we have uh, just a recap. So this is the end. Um, we have we want to move to progressive consent. Um, we want to give users a sense of control. Uh, we want to figure out how we can frame privacy decisions relatively, and privacy preserving having privacy preserving defaults is important, and allowing users to build their privacy preferences over time. Um, we have a demo that's actually still live at uportlandia.uport.me. Um, it's we're. Uport has undergone some changes in the past year or six months. So um, 
we're actually moving in some different directions, but uh, you know, this is still live. So if you want to check it out, you can. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the end of privacy and identity. There's a lot of other things around identity that I'm happy to talk about and take questions on as, as well, specifically around, you know, decentralized IDs and verifiable credentials and storage of stuff like, and stuff like that. Um, On-chain verifications, revocation, all of that stuff we can talk about too. Um, and then we can also talk about uh, more designy stuff as as well. But um, thanks for bearing with me as I as I ran through that. Well, wow, thank you, Johnny. That was awesome. Um, do we have any questions specifically about the identity or privacy piece? So I have a question okay. about um, oh. uh, data that wouldn't automatically be on chain. So um, the way you approach building these applications a lot of times just for cost reasons is keep as much off chain as possible and only keep the stuff you really need to verify on chain because your gas costs are going to blow you out of the water. Um, but, uh, you know, have you seen any good approaches for having some kind of like a hashed or encrypted version of like a bunch of off-chain data that you could selectively reveal and then prove that somebody could uh, show like, hey, I have um, this degree and I'm like friends with these five people. And that's not just on-chain visible to anybody, but if they gave access to a particular other person, they could check some hash that's on-chain and verify that that is accurate. Um, I'm not sure what the best patterns are for that. Yeah, so that's essentially what um, Uport has been trying to build and figure out for the past four years. Um, and so one, I would definitely just like look into our, our stuff. Um, but there's also teams that are doing very similar things that you can look into three box as well. Um, but this is really going to come down to the thing that makes that process work is did decentralized IDs and verifiable credentials. So in the scenario, I think that you're laying out is let's take, let's take the university degree. I want to prove that I have a degree. So I went to university of Texas. So I want to prove that I have a, de uh, a degree from university of Texas so that I can join who knows, let's say some DAO for, for uh, alumni or something like that. Um, the university of Texas, what they can do is they can publish they're, since they're a business and for, or an entity or an organization that doesn't have the same types of privacy concerns um, as an individual would, it's no problem for them to publish their decentralized ID on chain, right? Or in some public registry. And so they would have their public key um, published you know, at like utexas.edu's, um, this is a is actually a method that we proposed to the W3C um, called WebDid. And so it would allow uh, you to host your, your public key in a DID, according to the DID spec at a URL, at a domain. And so if you believe that the people that run the University of Texas's website are really the University of Texas and they haven't been hacked or taken over in some way or lost or, or transferred their hosting or something like that, then you should be able to trust the signatures that come from the did at that domain. And so what we would do is, you know, on chain, that is your, your did is a, like an Ethereum address appended with a method um, that is specific to whatever did spec you're using. Uh, at Uport, we use something called EtherDid, but uh, the three box team, they came up with something called 3ID. Um, I think that's what they're using, or they might be using some other did method. Um, there's sovereigns, there's IBMs, um, but you host it at utexas.edu. And um, now, they, the University of Texas could issue their diplomas as credentials. They sign a statement, just a JSON uh, blob, essentially, in a specific way. They sign it, and they sign it with their public key. They send it to you. I store it on my phone or in Uport or an identity wallet of some sort, and then I go to this DAO, this, you know, this DAP, 
and it asks for this, you know, using our libraries or somebody else's libraries, you can request that disclosure of that verifiable credential and that pops up on my phone. I hit share and now your DAP can verify that one, this diploma credential is about the person who just shared it, right? Because it will be the subject in that verifiable credential. The little subject line will point to my public key, which I will sign with my private key when I transfer you this verifiable credential. But then you'll also be able to verify the signature of who issued it to me by checking on chain um, for their what is called did document, uh, the University of Texas's did document. And now we have a way to move trusted data between parties um, off chain, um, but in a decentralized way. It's the only thing that's really on chain is the rules about how to consume and interact with a specific did. So these are the did methods. And then the actual public, uh, the public keys are Ethereum keys. So those are anchored on chain, but that's really the only stuff that's on chain, but it allows us to move trusted verifiable data off chain um, and, and have it be used in, in DAP context and, and whatnot. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Do we have any other questions on identity or we can move um, towards the very specific Q&A or like mini um, session with feedback for, for your projects? Kate says yes. Do you want to get us started, Kate? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I am actually a little bit conflicted because I don't know whether I have a question or not, but um, <laughs> it's about the privacy. And I've been, the whole purpose of Ethereum and decentralization is to bring equality to everybody. And now there's all this legislation for all the banking and wallets where you've got to do KYC. How do you reconcile the... Um, privacy concern and putting personal data on chain because like with crypto they take biometrics so it's kind of very specific and personal information and still remain decentralized so i'm not sure if i should be asking that question um, or should i just run into my project and um, show that Ooh. Well, um, we can definitely look at your project, but at a high level around KYC, I mean, this is a use case that we've worked on again for a long time. Um, it's a, it's super tricky. I'm not gonna gonna lie. Like uh, KYC, the problem of needing to do KYC is it's a big it's a big regulatory and you know jurisdictional problem more than it is an ethereum problem right so ethereum can i mean ethereum can offer DeFi and do all of this without doing kyc right it's not an actual technical requirement um but if you don't want to get arrested or shut down or fined for running your ethereum app and you want to play by your jurisdiction's rules um you have to do kyc so but um, and so that, that, that just automatically limits some of the, you know, high minded goals around equality that, uh, and accessibility, um, because, you know, lots of people can't perform KYC because they don't have access to real world, uh, government recognized identities. So we were just working on a project with the Red Cross in Kenya. Um, for aid refugees or aid recipients and refugees in Kenya um, that don't have identity documents, right? And what we were going to do is, you know, the red the project has now since been like postponed and everything because of the COVID stuff, and we couldn't go there and, and get on the ground and build stuff, um, so it's on hold. But um, the idea there was the Red Cross can could issue an identity uh, to these recipients um, that is just used between between them, 
um, between the Red Cross and the recipients. So uh, now they could, the Red Cross basically would do their form of KYC. Now, in their case, they have special rules around, they don't have to, they don't have to rise to the level of like a banking application um, because they are a humanitarian NGO and stuff and, they, and, and they're also in Kenya, which is a different jurisdiction. Um, but you can essentially, essentially what they're doing is they're verifying an identity, you know, uh, doing KYC of sorts, knowing, well, it's more like knowing your aid recipient than knowing your customer. Um, and they're issuing them a credential that is not on chain, but is stored on a, either a smartphone, but we are also getting into the space of uh, storing these things on feature phones and also smart cards and lots of stuff for low connectivity areas. And essentially now what these refugee, refugees or aid recipients can do, they can go to other, you know, maybe it's a UN camp or aid station and they can present their Red Cross um, identity to them. And this isn't an official identity, but really what we're trying to do when we verify identities is, is it's more of like a probabilistic trust thing where if it rise, like the KYC thing is like an artificial standard of, of trust. It's a, per, it's pushed on companies when maybe, you know, in the Red Cross situation, they don't, they're happy to give you aid even though they haven't checked every single database around the world for your identity. But when we're working in like, um, so that, that, that's all to point out the fact that KYC is like this artificial kind of construct that we take for granted because it's just been around for so long. So we also worked on a project um, with, in the UK with a, a company called Onfido and some of the banks there it was called the FCA Regulatory Sandbox and we were trying to build reusable KYC. And so what you could do here is I get KYC'd and I think you, could, you can do this today. So this is something to look into if it's relevant to um, your project, um, which is you can work with somebody like Onfido, which is an identity verification service. It's who Coinbase uses. You can get Onfido. What we were working with was we were, or, you know, we were working with Onfido to use their SDK. So you have an app. You go through there, take a selfie, um, put, upload your passport or driver's license. They run a KYC check, but then they issue that check of you passing KYC as one of these verifiable credentials to you to the user. Um, and then the user then presents that off-chain signed data, that data that's signed by Onfido, presents that to something like Coinbase or whatever other exchange or other application, and they don't have to be KYC'd again, right? They don't have to, they've done one last KYC and they can be KYC'd uh, for the entire jurisdiction of financial products that are operating but in the UK. Wouldn't that be centralizing the information and that would be one entity storing all the personal in, um, information and that makes it more risky? Well, so on Fido, well, this is this, yes and no. So like, because of the laws, on Fido has to store the user information. That's just the law, right? The law forces centralization, but it doesn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. On Fido, once they once they attest to the fact that this person has passed the KYC check, they just need to sign that statement, issue it back to the user, and they theoretically, if the law didn't require didn't require them to keep the data, they could just delete the data, right, and not store any of the data, not have any of the liability around um, being hacked or you know acting in you know nefarious ways they could just run the check delete the data issue you the credential and now you can use that reusable kyc wherever you want um but the laws are in in the us and in the uk and in the rest of the eu are such that if you're doing kyc you have to store the user data of who you've kyc'd for at least five years i think it is uh, five to 10 years, depending on the country. Um, and so until that law gets changed, we won't, even though technically we can do decentralized 
privacy, better privacy preserving KYC today, the laws haven't caught up. And that's just the, uh, you know, that's just the, the situation that we're in. I think lots of people yeah. are arguing that you, you, the reason that they were having these companies store this stuff was because uh, these technologies that we're taking advantage of now didn't exist yet, right? So they had to have a record, that company had to have a record of, to prove um, what happened during that person's KYC process, right? And now all of that could be stored with the user, signed and sent to the user for them to store on their own side, on their own, on their phone, or in some encrypted web storage of some sort. Um, and that is where we would like, that's where we're trying to push this whole system and, and industry towards, but um, the law just doesn't allow for that yet. Thank you, yeah. I think to, in my mind, I'm, I still don't quite understand it because to me, the problem that the blockchain solves is exactly that you don't need mm -hmm. the KYC and you don't need all of that. And now it's like we are trying to do, I don't know if you know Waterfall versus Agile, mm -hmm. but the two are inherently two different opposing ways of doing things and they cannot coincide at the same time. And to me, it feels as if that's what we are trying to do with forcing the old methods onto the newest system. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I agree. And this is, this is why at least the UK government created this pilot program, the FCA Sandbox, because they were, um, I think FCA stands for like financial compliance authorities, I think. Um, but they were trying to, you know, they were hearing us talk about this and saying that it is possible to do KYC and all of these things in ways that, uh, don't force these bad privacy outcomes onto society. And they, that's, that's what we were experimenting with. So maybe the law is at, on the verge of changing. Um, I don't actually know if that pilot program and that whole thing that they were doing actually resulted in any new legislation being proposed. But um, generally the feedback when we ran it was good and it seemed like the authorities and regulators are starting to one just fundamentally be aware that these things can be done and also uh, understand them to the point where they feel like they can trust them enough to write laws that change the laws to say if you're not running one of these decentralized systems like now you know hopefully the law will be either you can do one of two things you can issue the verifiable credential issue a verifiable credential of that KYC data back to the user for them to store, or you can store it for five years, but somebody has to store it, right? And you publish maybe, um, you know, there's ideas around building a, a private chain for regulators that kind of is like a side chain to a lot of stuff where you might publish the hash of this interaction between this did and this regulator or this are on FIDO or identity, identity verification service you might publish the hash of that interaction onto this private chain. And it can be referenced only by only regulators can view that because there's still GDPR stuff around publishing hashes of private information. And uh, you can't even publish encrypted information on chain, um, but hashes are a little bit different. And I think the uh, legally it's still up in the air how that, how that's going to come down as to whether or not that's allowed. Um, so there's still stuff to figure out, but it seems like things are moving in, in a, in a way that will, I mean, you could always just, you know, there is this idea of like, I think Augur did this or some other apps, which is you just make a, you just put the DAP out of your control and then, <laughs> What are, what are authorities going to do, right? You remove your ability to control the system and then, um, so you could build a DAP today that uses decentralized KYC, ignore the laws and, you know, take your chances with the authorities once they come, once they come knocking, right? But because it's not a technical problem, you can get to the level of trust you need to, uh, do a lot of these financial use cases. It's really just how much of a fight are you looking for with, with the authorities at this point? 
Thanks. Did anybody else have um, any questions about their project? I know, Ivana, did you mention you were working on a project that focuses on privacy or anything like that? I'm not sure. I thought I heard it earlier. Oh, um, I had another question about uh, context switching. So um, you have different, I guess, personas in life and specifically for our project you might be a buyer on a platform or you might be a seller or you might be a seller that has multiple different stores and you would switch context by switching wallet addresses but I don't know how to really do that workflow like if you don't want to tie um, your buyer address when you're just looking to buy something to all of your history as a seller um, just for whatever reason mm -hmm. um, you know have people thought through how to do that in a way that is only a couple of clicks and actually yeah. makes sense. Yeah, so I can't say that this is like, if y'all were gonna build this, you would be forging a little bit of new ground. Um, but again, it's one of those things that seems to be theoretically possible. Um, in a older version of Uport, we had what was called app specific accounts. So we had a root did, and uh, from, and we use, you know, like an HD key, you know, a hierarchical de derivation of keys. Um, and we would generate new Ethereum keys for all of the different dApps that you use. And, and these wouldn't be, um, and we would store, do some, you know, uh, smart stuff in the back end of the user's app where we would just remember that this is the dap and this is the key used with that dap and stuff like that so but the user didn't realize that they were generating new ethereum keys for every new dap that they interacted with but um and so what we could do is now you're able to share your let's say your kyc credential um via this ethereum address with crypto kitties and via this ethereum address with you know uniswap or whatever other dap right and they don't those two apps don't see the same ethereum address now but you're able to use your verifiable credentials one the same verifiable credentials in both contexts even though they're running i guess through different ethereum addresses so Uniswap sees this Ethereum address, they look on chain, you know, they go to Etherscan or whatever, and they see that this is like a fresh um, Ethereum address with no history, but they can, the, the person using that Ethereum address has authenticated themselves um, via that KYC credential that's not on chain to them. And the problem becomes really when you want to start moving money around, right? So that using off-chain credentials can preserve your privacy and allow you to use lots of different Ethereum addresses and sign up for lots of different dApps without uh, any correlation risk. Pri the problem becomes when I have a bunch of money in this Ethereum address and I need to use it across all of these different dApps. And so now I have to move my money uh, from this central wallet of mine to all of these new contextual wallets and that then provides the correlation risk. So that's kind of where everybody kind of got hung up. But now with things like, I don't know, like tornado cash and um, ZK die and what Aztec's doing and stuff like that, maybe it is possible now to also make the movement of, of those funds private enough to where combining verifiable credentials, generating Ethereum addresses on every interaction, and then running the funds as you transfer them between those inter, uh, those addresses through a mixer, you could probably put this system together in, a, in a, at least a, a way that's better than anything that's happening now. Thanks. Any other questions? or projects that we're building on. And Jordan has joined us as well. Oh, sorry, Jordan, you were literally just taking a sip <laughs> of your drink. Um, do you want to quickly introduce yourself as well? Because you joined us a little bit afterwards. 
Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> hey, I'm uh, Jordan. Uh, I work on the I guess, product and design team at Maker. Um, and yeah, that's really about it. Been there for maybe two and a half, three years. Um, so yeah, seen really the evolution of the, the um, I guess, design and the crypto space. Um, so yeah. Well, any advice you would want to give our builders at money based on the observation of the evolution of design in the past two or three years yeah that's a good question I think uh, I think unlike yeah it, it's similar to like any type of product right um, or like designing for any type of product I think really focusing on or really understanding the situation that whoever what whatever user you're building for or designing for is in is really really uh, important um, and specifically what I mean is like I think people generally take like this notion of like a person using a DAP or something and like they're just this one general person and this is just not true right like there's different people in different circumstances and really understanding that circumstance is is really really uh, important so for example like um, if you're someone using DAI like there's people use DAI for different types of things in different types of situation and situations and like really understanding that situation will allow you to like really be intentional about the different types of uh, features or different types of elements in the UI that, that may or may not be important to, to a user. Cool, yeah, we covered, um personas with with Sasha earlier on in in the session and I think we had a lot of different questions uh, around those personas and you know how to um, decide on what the main persona is when you when you build right if you have to pick when you don't necessarily have a lot of data um, so that's that's been a an interesting um, element of our discussion um, I don't know if if um, the guys who are still i'm aware that this is like a, a very long session so i know that um some people have, have messaged me that they have to draw because they have other uh calls or or engagements um i wonder if there are um any kind of main takeaways or tips that you guys would have and i'm talking to to you know johnny sasha jordan amy um, for for these guys, they're halfway through the hackathon now, um, or or anybody building, I guess. Um, what would be the main things to to keep in mind, or one key bit of resource that I know? Again, we've shared in the chat some very cool resources that that um, we'll also share with all the participants that um, signed up, but. We just want to absorb all of your knowledge, essentially. This is what's happening. Um, actually, I will, oh, this will be like super quick, but let me just, and I'll share this, you know, I'll, uh, it's in my local keynote, so I'll need to generate like some keynote share link or something, but um, mm -hmm. let me see here. Can you see this visibility of system status? Yes. So, um, one thing I'll share is that there's this idea of usability heuristics from Jacob Nielsen. Um, uh, I went through and I kind of showed how these things might apply to different crypto scenarios and, and for dApps. Um, and so these are things like just, uh, you know, rattle off the 10 um, things to think about. And again, I'll, I'll share this presentation is visibility of system status um, so you see this a lot in you know metamask right pending states and stuff about around transactions um, matching between systems and the real world um, we see uh, this idea of like signatures and uh, uh, I think what I have here the system should speak the user's language with words phrases concepts familiar to 
the user rather than system oriented terms, which is a huge problem in most crypto stuff. Um, and follow real world conventions, making information appear in a natural logical order. So an example of this is, you know, the message portion of when you uh, signed um, to log in or whatever to CryptoKitties with MetaMask it was the first time I had seen them use that message section to actually do some copywriting. So they actually brought their brand through here rather than it just saying some standard, very technical crypto, uh, you know, BS of like, we need access to your wallet so that we can do X and Y and, you know, get your public key and all of this stuff. Um, so that was a good idea. Um, I would also recommend, you know, there was a team for a while at Consensus called Rimble, which was a design systems team. Um, in addition to their like React component library and their Figma file with like um, a lot of the pre-built components, um, they also have these guides for certain common crypto things or just around UX of like things to think about when you're designing your, your dApps. So I would recommend that as a resource. Um, other third one, user control and freedom. Um, this is giving the user choices. So here's Coinbase wallet. It's allowing you to, you know, back up now, remind later, don't show again. So we often see this also doing it the wrong way in crypto is like, uh, you make users like can't even go to the next screen until they write down their 12 word seed phrase. Right. And that's like super annoying because there's no money on these keys yet. You don't even know if you're going to keep using these keys. So I think giving the user the choice there is something to think about. Um, consistency and standards. This is stuff that in our space is really hasn't been settled on a ton. Right. Like we call things gas or fees or network cost or whatever and so those standards are still kind of emerging um i actually don't know what the standard is around like gas right now so metamask was calling them transaction fees and they did this this standard of fat, uh, slow average and fast right some people use sliders and stuff like that but uh that's something to be on the lookout for is like what is the standards that are emerging around some of these patterns um Error prevention. Um, so this is something we had in uh, in Uport at one point, which was um, if you don't, if your app has, is, if this is the first time that you are interacting with this, with these keys, this public key or public address on Ethereum, so some new DAP or whatever. Um, if it, we were also doing a blacklisting thing, but essentially you want to prevent errors before they occur, I guess is the general theme of this. And you see this a lot in like, you know, like Chrome, I would say, uh, like in Google Chrome, when you navigate to a questionable website whose certificates uh, for their website aren't matching or whatever, it says, are you sure you wanna do this? So that's, and, and this obviously the stakes are higher in, in DAP world because you get your money drained and, and all of that. So something to think about there. Um, recognition rather than recall um, you want to minimize people's cognitive load um, so i think what does it say minimize the user's memory load by making objects actions and options visible the user should not have to remember information from one part of the dialogue to another um, instructions for use of the system should be visible and easily retrievable whenever appropriate so here you know is an example of all of the assets that you have access to in your MetaMask wallet. So you don't have to remember that you have uh, however much AirSwap token or however many crypto kitties. It's allowing, it's bringing that to the surface um, for you. So you don't have to remember any of that, right? So I've seen other wallets where, oh, where'd my phone go? Um, I've seen other wallets where you have to like manually type in the assets, like, you know, little ticker symbol, I guess is, I don't know what the abbreviation. Um, so like AST or whatever. Um, this has been something I think a lot of wallets have solved, but you know, something to think about. Um, flexibility and efficiency of use. So accelerators unseen by the note, by the novice user, 
may often speed up the interaction for the expert user such that the system can cater to both inexperienced and experienced users, allow users to tailor frequent actions. In Uport, this was something around that I was talking about earlier around setting up your preferences as you go along. So as you become an advanced user, your selective disclosure actions become more efficient. Um, you might see this same type of stuff as abilities to set preferences on your like gas estimation and speed, right? So you always, you can just set it to fast every time or slow every time. Um, and these are things that you would build, allow users to build inside of your product over time that make it even more and more usable as they go on. Um, aesthetic and minimalist design, I think we're all familiar with this. This is Argent, they do a really good job. Um, uh, I, I, you know, just putting, you know, not a lot of distractions. Um, so dialogues should not contain information which is irrelevant or rarely needed. Uh, every extra unit of information in a dialogue competes with the relevant units of information and diminishes their relative visibility. So there's this big fallacy, I think, in web design, digital design, around like the three-click rule, I think, um, which is, and in, in the idea is just reducing the number of clicks a user has to make is better user experience. And I would argue that, um, I would use as many clicks as it's better to use more clicks and constrain the information on every screen to very easily digestible um, pieces of information uh, that they move through in some logical way. So if you have to tell them three things, you can put all three of those things, cram it all onto one screen, or you can put each one of those things on their own screen. Um, and I would actually argue that that's a better idea, even though it's more clicks. Um, it helps with the cognitive overload um, that a user would experience. Um, that's really important during onboarding, I would say. Um, so help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. Um, we see this a lot. Again, this is MetaMask. Um, you know, if you have something pending or stuck, the ability to go over to Etherscan, debug what is happening, uh, you know, trying to tell the user what probably went wrong, all of that type of stuff is stuff to think about. Um, and then finally, help and documentation, which relates to that. Um, so even though it is better if the system can be used without documentation, it may be necessary to provide help and documentation. Any such information should be easy to search, focused on the user's task, list of concrete steps to be carried out, and not be too large. So this, um, you know, again, CryptoKitties at one point, I haven't used it in a long time, but um, they had, you know, the tutorial, the helper text kind of embedded in the experience. And you see this a lot with like first time UX and mobile apps where the user experience, or the, 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 the tutorial, the documentation is kind of embedded in your first use and you're actually using the product rather than reading about using the product, um, which I think is, is helpful. Extra stuff, uh, Fiat on ramps, Rimble has some tips on that. Um, which could be interesting for a lot of your apps, um, distinguishing between on-chain and off-chain data. I talked about that in the identity talk, so I won't talk about that again here. Uh, progressive decentralization is an interesting concept that I think a lot of designers have been talking about where like, you don't have to force the user to be completely decentralized and self-sovereign on their first use. You can kind of guide them through this progressively over the course, over the lifetime of their product. So maybe you are managing their keys for them at the beginning and then giving them the ability to manage their own keys and then being giving them the ability to set up like some social recovery and stuff. I think burner wallet stuff um, does a good job of this, right? Where, um, at the beginning, you have this like precariously managed key, and then you can, if you get money on it, or if you have money on there, that's something to lose. Um, you can push the user to now take more control and migrate that money to a better secure, you know, wallet. Um, and I think that is it. And I'll send out these slides, but those are just some tips. Uh, generally for building all sorts of gaps and whatnot. That's super helpful, actually. And you're right, there's so much, because I remember just doing things like um, 
onboarding newcomers and then you kind of onboard them onto one wallet and then you mention oh there's this other type of wallet and then suddenly they're like wait what why why is that one safe and that one isn't what do you mean what so being able to do that gradually i think is less of a shock to the system right where you're just like you're introducing all of these new concepts for me what am i even supposed to do yeah so i I, think we had um i was gonna say i actually like um i don't know if anybody's used it but coinbase right is you you get started with crypto and it's completely centralized custodian way and then they have a feature in there that uh, pushes the user to move their Ethereum to the Coinbase wallet, right? And um, I think that that's a good little little pattern, right? So after you have money and you have Ethereum on Coinbase, they tell you, oh, you can download this wallet and they e- give you an easy UX bridge, right? Like click here to you know make this migration, migrate your money to a place where you're managing the keys. Now, I have problems with like, the privacy aspect of this because now they know who you are on chain and they can watch everything you do with your Ethereum. Um, but, you know, from the progressive decentralization stuff, um, I think that that's like an example of, of that in action. Cool. That makes sense. And I also really like that example with the messaging that the Crypto Kitties guys did in MetaMask. I think I had that once where with a MetaMask pop-up where I was teaching at a university uh, about just like basic stuff and getting the students to um, fulfill a bounty after we had uh, created a wallet. And the pop-up came up, keeping in mind that I'm in the UK, and the pop-up came up saying, hi there, your special nonce is, and then like all of the different characters. And then it was sign. One of the main things is that nonce in um, the UK is also a word for pedophile. So I was introducing this new thing, making them sign this message and everybody just went, wait, what? So <laughs> that was an interesting explanation that I had to give but again it's something that you kind of look at it and go okay what is happening maybe I will not sign this because who knows what will happen so yeah definitely useful yeah so uh, a presentation that I actually gave with Simona uh for people uh for dragon quest hackathon also the 10 ux heuristics and other tips and tricks so you can check it out there guys i have also updated the privacy (laughs) for the document so you can all access it by that link no problem perfect Thank you, Sasha. I think one thing okay, that we've, well. that I've seen or that we've uh, learned is like, hello? Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, so I think one thing that we've, we've learned is like, um, is that uh, like, uh, uh, users or whomever you're designing for when they're in whatever DAP is like this notion of reassurance. Because I think there's these specific moments, right? Like when you do a transaction or when you're going to sign a transaction or when you're going to like do something where you're actually like there's an event that actually happens. Um, it's actually quite terrifying, both for novice users and for experienced users. Whereas um, there are some things that you can do with, that are just purely informational or actions that you can take that are actually not doing things on chain that produce anxiety within users but they actually shouldn't so i think um like really showing that contrast or providing like um like mm, documentation or some acknowledgement that like hey this is what this action that you're doing actually has consequences whereas these actions that you're doing don't have consequences so you can play over here but be very careful you know over there 
Um, yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, and that's a that's a big one, isn't it? Because we're so used to from the centralized world to just nothing really has that much of a consequence, right? You can recover things, you can do the things again. You forgot your password, you can change it ten thousand times. And I think there was um, a conversation on Twitter the other day where there was a fake Elon Musk account that was asking people for ETH, and then somebody sent him this fake one. I don't know how much ETH, and then he was tweeting, "Coinbase, you must um, undo this because it's a fake Elon." And it's like, well, no, <laughs> that doesn't work that way. So, yeah, I think that's definitely important. Um, I mean, if we don't have any other questions, um, I think this has been a great uh, experimental session, um, I would say. I think um, it's been a lot of um, super, super important and super great content. And I think we've answered a few questions. Um, we'll send everyone the decks if you haven't picked them up from um, from the chat. And then Heather, I'll also send you a couple of email addresses that people have send me in the chat privately um and then yeah that's about it thank you so much everyone and should we do this again yes yeah yes okay cool um that is the resounding yes <laughs> But thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, share the uh, recording as well. I don't know. We'll put it on the ETH Global YouTube, maybe? Yeah. Let's just do that. I think that's the, the, the easiest thing. For sure. Perfect. And then we'll um, share it on Twitter as well. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, Sasha, Johnny, um, Jordan, Amy, um, and obviously, Heather and Emily and Trent from the ETH Global team. And good luck, everyone. Win everything. And thank you so much. Thank Thanks you, everybody, so for presenting and sharing. That was awesome. Thank you. Good. Yeah. I'm glad. See you later. Bye.